Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California invites you to Let George Do It. Before we begin tonight's adventure of George Valentine, here's a reminder that it takes more than one feature in a gasoline to give you all-round dependable performance. That's why Chevron Supreme gasoline is designed and refined to give you not one, not two, but all eight high-performance qualities. Fast starting, quick warm-up, smooth acceleration, anti-knock, vapor lock prevention, area blending, economy mileage, and full power. So for top all-round performance in your car, switch to the gas with all eight. Fill up with Chevron Supreme gasoline at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Now, tonight's story, Once a Crook, a transcribed adventure of George Valentine. You must find my brother, Mr. Valentine, before the police find him. But if I do find him, Miss Croner, he'll only go back to jail. Oh, he mustn't. He's innocent. Well, he may be, dear, but from what you yourself told us, the case against him is open and shut. Too open and too shut. There is such a thing. Well, isn't there? All right, let's go through it again. Your brother Ralph went to prison two years ago because he stole some money from the bank where he worked. A large sum of money. He made a mistake, but he paid for it. All right, now. Yesterday, he came back to Sageville, to your uncle's house, and during the night, apparently tried to rob the safe. Your uncle surprised him. Ralph half killed him with a blow on his head, and then he ran away. That's not fair. You're making it too simple, too horrible. Betty, look. Mr. Valentine is just trying to make you see the facts. Doesn't it matter that I know my brother better than anyone else in the world does? Why, he wouldn't have done that to Uncle John. He ran away and the safe is empty. That's one of the things that's all wrong. Ralph knew that Uncle John never kept any real money or valuables in that safe, so well, why would he want to break into it? I don't know, Betty. He may have known something we don't know. Ralph lived all his life in Sageville. He never knew how to blow a safe open. And you learn all sorts of things in jail, I'm afraid. Ralph came home from prison with absolutely nothing but the clothes on his back. And he didn't leave the house. He had no tools. He had nothing with which he could have blown that safe open. Betty, please, believe me, I'm not trying to be cruel. But the police will say that he made plans with some safe cracker he met in jail. He let him into the house. If, as your uncle says, there wasn't anything of value in the safe, well, that's just too bad. Ralph failed and ran. No. Your uncle, how is he? He's in the hospital. Pretty bad, but... I say he'll pull through. He won't stop until Ralph goes back to jail and stays there. He may not do that. Oh, you don't know Uncle John. He's a fanatic on the subject of honor. It was all I could do to talk him into letting Ralph come home at all. Once a crook, always a crook. That was one of the kinder things Uncle said. And now he's more convinced than ever. After Ralph got into trouble, people might have forgiven him. Sageville's a small town. We were raised there after our parents died. But Uncle John never forgave Ralph. Of all the people, he never did. Benny, let's be practical. You have no idea where Ralph might have gone, have you? No. My chances of finding him are much smaller than the sheriff's. So even if I do... Ralph is running. And if we don't find him, he'll be running for the rest of his life. Even if he's innocent, he's scared. Benny, why don't you go back to the hotel? Your train doesn't leave till this evening. I... Well, I'll, I'll let you know what I decide. Oh, Miss Brooks, can't you... Go on, Betty. It's hey, better. Wait a minute. What is it, George? Somebody's outside. Don't you know it's impolite to eavesdrop, Buster? Oh, eavesdrop? Is that the way you talk to a colleague, Valentine? Oh, it's you. Well, if it isn't Mr. Ridley. Better leave the door open, George. We need the air. Always clowning, ain't you, Miss Brooks? Nope. I thought you lost your private investigator's license in this state. I got me another one. In another state. I got friends. I bet. What's on your mind? Well, I am on the case, the Kroner case. What? Do you know the uh, gentleman, Betty? No. Oh, don't worry. I'm hired nice and legitimate in this case. Yeah, by whom? Uh-uh. Tut-tut. Professional ethics. Ha! 
That's why I'm following the little lady. I uh, thought I'd give you a chance to join up with me, Valentine. Doing what? Finding Ralph Croner and bringing him to justice. The fee will be big enough for both of us. Get out. What'd you say? Ouch. Okay, punk. You'll wish you had a chance to work with me. I'll make you sorry you ever opened your big mouth. Okay, you scared me. I'll see you. This man, why would he follow me all the way from Sageville? Maybe he thought you'd lead him to your brother. Come on, Brooksy, get going. You don't have much time to pack a bag. Yes, sir, Master. If a character like Al Ridley is in the middle of this case, it's the best recommendation your brother has, Betty. We'll meet you on the train. <laughs> Stay here with Betty, Brooksy. I want to look around, see if there are any familiar faces. Well, I didn't see Mr. Ridley, Mr. Valentine. Sure, he isn't here. Uh-huh. Be careful, darling, please. Sure, Angel, sure. Looking for me, Valentine? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No wonder. I couldn't smell you through the compartment door. Keep cracking wise while you can. Uh, you know Marco, don't you? Oh, the case must really be a big one to bring your killer friend with you. I could sue you for libel, Jack, but I'm a peaceable man. <laughs> we just bumped into each other on the train, Valentine. Honest to bets. Happy, happy coincidence. And we're having a beer together, see? Uh-huh. Now I would like you to come with me to the back platform, Valentine. I want to talk to you. Alone. Some other time, Buster. I said now. Oh, I see. A hopped-up punk with a knife is a dangerous playmate even for you, Ridley. Go with him. Sure, sure. It's a shame there's hardly anybody on this train, eh, Jack? Yeah, a shame. Out there. Okay, what's on your mind? I want to tell you something. I didn't want no company. Yeah? I think you should stay out of this case, Jack. Get on the next train going back and blow. That's what I think. Thanks for the advice. It's not advice, it's an order. You don't say. A knife kills somebody too quick, Jack. Much too quick. You should know. But a broken beer bottle, all nice and jagged. That can really be some fun. Before a knife finishes the job. Out there. That's right, Jack. Easy Jump. now. And again. Are you crazy punk. Sure. Sure. Of course, I'm not doing anything now. Just talking to you. Just giving you a good tip. Now we'll go back inside and forget we was mad on each other, huh? On the ranch, Mr. Valentine. I'll show you where the safe is. All right. Hey, this is quite a place. Away from the rest of town and right on the edge of the desert. Uncle John always liked to stay away from people. Sagebrush and cactus all around instead of a lawn. Uncle John says he left them to remind himself and the rest of us that life has its harsh responsibilities as well as pleasures. <laughs> Sounds like a lovable old fellow. Oh, he really isn't bad. He's just old-fashioned and strong-willed. Yeah, okay, let's get going. Ralph was staying in his old room. That one right there. I see. The library where the safe is. It's, well, it's right down the hall. Where's your uncle's room? Over there. Oh, that safe is sure enough a mess. I heard the explosion. I came running. It was dark in here. I turned on the light and I saw Uncle John lying on the floor and, well, Ralph was gone. And these big French doors were open? Mm-hmm. It was a disgraceful assault on a poor, defenseless man. Ah. Mr. Bowen. I was waiting for you, Betty. This is Mr. Bowen. Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine. Hello. Hello. Mr. Bowen is Uncle John's lawyer and a friend of the family. And in the capacity of both, I want you to get off the case, Mr. Valentine. Oh, why? What are you talking about, Mr. Bowen? Mr. Croner is determined that no help whatsoever be given Ralph. He must be feeling better. And I must interpret anything that Betty does as intended to help Ralph. 
But he's innocent. I must help him. That's hardly unnatural, is it, Mr. Bowen? Hmm? Just the same, I must advise you, Mr. Valentine, that Betty is underage. Merely a ward of Mr. Croner's. She has no money of her own. I'll speak to Uncle John. I'll make him say easy, easy, Betty. Don't worry about the money. Forget about that part of it. Besides, I think Mr. Bowen's interest in this case is, uh, is, shall we say, more than just casual. And, uh, what is that supposed to mean, young man? Well, I was just wondering who hired that sterling character, Al Ridley. And now I know. It was you, wasn't it, Mr. Bowen? Why, I... I How else would you nonsense. have known about me so quickly unless Al Ridley reported to his client? But I tell you, I... All right. Why not? I was determined to do what I could to help the police bring a criminal to justice. Oh, now, wait I a minute. Did... Don't protest too much, Mr. Bowen. Yeah, yeah. Now I think I'll speak to Mr. Croner in the hospital. A private little talk. <laughs> It's no use, Mr. Valentine. How many times must I tell you? My mind is made up. But look, look, please, Mr. Croner. If you didn't actually see who attacked you, there's at least a chance that it wasn't Ralph. There was nobody else in the house, and Ralph ran away. Now, you know as well as I do that innocent people don't run away. Yeah, but Ralph deserves the benefit of any doubt. Now, listen, Mr. Valentine. I I may be an old-fashioned man, but I, I have some very strong feelings about honor. Now, when Ralph stole that money from the bank, I washed my hands off him completely. Understand? No longer a nephew of mine. Yeah, so I heard, so I heard. The code of honor is a stern one. It must have no compromises. I listened to Betty and told her to let Ralph come here when he was released from prison. <laughs> he didn't disappoint me. Once a crook, always a crook. Well, look, I have to say something, Mr. Cromer. I haven't lived as long as you have, but I know what you just said isn't so. I don't want you in this case. You understand that? You'll do yourself a favor if you'll stop meddling in our affairs and leave Sageville. I feel very sorry for you, Mr. Croner. There's no place in life for fanatics, even for fanatics about such noble things as honor. Oh, my word. Mr. Bowen will pay you for whatever expenses you've incurred so far. Now, please, please leave me alone, will you? I'm, I'm still a, a very sick man. Wait. Yeah, what is it, Brooksy? Betty? This may be very important, Mr. Valentine. I told Miss Brooks and she thought... Well, it is strange, George, and so I thought... I was the... sure of it right away. Well, okay, okay, both of you. Simmer down, will you tell George, me? George, we were walking down the street, and Betty pointed at a man, and she said she saw him get off the train the day she came down to the station to meet Ralph. Uh-huh, yeah. the day he came from prison, Mr. Valentine. Well, I looked at the man. Do you know who it was? Marco. Marco? That's right. But Al Ridley claims he was hired only after Ralph ran away. And his favorite hood was in Sageville the day before. Oh, what does this all mean? There's something wrong here, Mr. Valentine. You aren't going to leave now, are you? No, no, no. I just spoke to the sheriff, Sam Gunter. Oh. He told me he didn't need any help from outsiders. He told me to get going. Ridley and Marco. Bowen and Croner. And now the sheriff. Yeah, the advice is unanimous. Stay out. Well, maybe that's why I'm going to disregard it and stay in. <laughs> Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. With cooler days ahead, you'll be calling on your battery for more and more power for your heater, for the engine that's a little harder to start. And with the days getting shorter, you'll be using your headlights more, too. So right now is a good time to have the battery in your car checked and serviced, if needed. Your car saver can tell you in a moment if your battery is up to par. And if you need a new battery, he can give you complete information on a new, super-powerful Atlas battery that's a guaranteed, dependable performer. Easy terms are available with a small down payment and up to six months to pay. No down payment is necessary if you're a Chevron credit card holder. And your car saver will give you an allowance for your old battery. So, to be sure of a start all through the winter, better stop in soon for a car saver battery checkup at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean 
We take better care of your car. Once a crook, always a crook. That's the stern code by which John Croner swears. And apparently it's been vindicated in the case of his nephew, Ralph. For on the very day that Ralph was released from prison, he assaulted his uncle, robbed his safe, and ran. It seems open and shut. But if your name is George Valentine, at least two points need explanation. Why is Al Ridley, a discredited and shady private investigator, involved in this case? And why did Ridley's strong-arm boy and killer, Stan Marco, show up in Sageville on the very day that Ralph returned home from prison? This room of Ralph's hasn't been touched, has it, Betty? No, Mr. Valentine. Old Sheriff Gunter was in here. He looked around, but he didn't disturb anything. His mind was already made up about Ralph, like everyone else's. Oh, I... I don't know what you or I can do for Ralph. Well, we're at least going to try to get at the truth, aren't we, Betty? Oh, yes, but... That's all we can do. And you must help us. Of course, I'm, I'm sorry. Hey, tell me, this this room is kind of barren, isn't it? I mean, no personal things of Ralph's. Nothing much about. Nothing on the dresser. Well, when Ralph went to prison, Uncle John threw all his things out. Didn't want anything to remind him of a, a jailbird, he said. Yeah, I know. He told me that himself. Someday I'm going to sit down with this Uncle John and tell him a thing or two. Oh, he's as hard on himself as he is on anybody else. The code of honor is a stern taskmaster. Let's review this. As I get it, Ralph came here after dinner. That's right now, isn't it? Oh, no, no. You see, he talked to Uncle John for a while. I don't know how long, because I went to my room first. I see. Well, he must have sat here and smoked for quite some time. All these cigarette stubs in the ashtray. Sheriff Gunter said that proved his point all the more. That Ralph was waiting for Uncle John to fall asleep so that he could rob the safe. Mm Mm-hmm. The closet... Or anything in the closet? Well, I don't think so. Well, let's take a look. Hmm. Pretty bare. No clothes. Not even a... What have you found, George? What is it? On the corner, over there. Wait a minute. What? A pair of shoes. Ralph's shoes. Are you sure they're his? Well, yes. They're the heavy, clumsy shoes they gave him in prison. I know, because... See, I noticed him when I first met him at the train. Well, now that's funny. Well, they won't help the case much. They'll say he took his shoes off before he went into the library so he wouldn't make any noise. Wait a minute, Brooksy. Ralph had no other shoes, no no house slippers, nothing like that? No, I told you before, no. All right, take a look. Right here in the other corner, on the dust on the floor. Huh? Ralph's room was closed all these years. Some footprints. Yeah, but not the big, heavy ones from Ralph's shoes. The man who stood here wore smaller shoes with pointed toes. Well, what does that mean, Mr. Valentine? I'm not sure, but come on. Betty, you've got to be our guide while we go sightseeing. (laughs) Sagebrush and cactus. From the house straight up to the bench road up there. Desert. As far as the eye can see. Yeah. And mountains in the distance. Those are the dead hills. Dead hills? Mm Mm-hmm. Bandits are supposed to have hid out there in the old days. Hey, tell me, that road up there, where does it lead? Both ways? Well, this way it goes into town. The other way it goes into the hills. Any other way of getting out of the hills? Only a much longer way. About four or five miles from here, there's a fork in the road. Well, the fork follows the hills and hollows across the highway 15 miles after it leaves the main road. George, what are you trying to find out? I think I have found it. What? Angel, go back to the house with Betty. I want to get together a little meeting in John Croner's hospital room. Mr. Valentine, I told you what the nurse said. Mr. Croner is a sick man, and it's late. Well, let the young fellow have his say, boy. Thanks. Yeah, let him have his say and get out of town. I can help him leave. Never mind, Ridley. Well, what I have to say, gentlemen, is very simple. Ralph Croner didn't run away. He was kidnapped. Kidnapped? I never... Oh, this guy is nuts. Make yourself clear, Mr. Valentine. I said Ralph was kidnapped. That's clear enough. What makes you think so? Ralph was raised on your ranch, Mr. Croner. He knows this country well. He knows he couldn't get very far along the cactus and sagebrush without his shoes. 
What shoes are you talking about? I'm talking about his prison shoes, the only pair he owned. Oh, nonsense. If he did assault you in the library, Mr. Croner, all he had to do was spend another couple of seconds to go back to his room, get his shoes from the closet, and then run. Who kidnapped the kid, a ghost? Yes, who? There's nobody else in the house. Are you sure? I saw the footprints of another man in the closet. Ridley, could it have been your playmate, Marco? But I don't know what you're talking about. You don't, huh? I think that whoever was hiding in the closet slugged Ralph, then dragged him out through the French doors in the library. But why? Yes. If Ralph is innocent, why would anyone take a chance on kidnapping? Why not leave him behind? That's something I don't know yet. But I have a little theory. I think that Ralph is being kept prisoner by someone up there in those dead hills. You... You're just guessing, aren't you, Mr. Valentine? At the moment, I am, yes. But, Mr. Croner, you ought to help me make sure... In the morning, I'd like you to arrange a searching party. Well, You owe that much to a man you think is guilty. That's a waste of time. Still, I can't see any harm in it. Okay, then, gentlemen, that's it. Unless there are other questions. No questions, friend. No. No, nothing. Good, good. Then we'll see what tomorrow morning will bring. And I think we're due for a little surprise. I know it's late, Sheriff, but I think what I told you will really work. Well, I don't know, Valentine. And only you can help me. Well... Oh, look, please, Sheriff, we know there's no other way out of the hills except the Fork Road. Yeah, that's right. And any car will have to go into second gear to go up that mountain at that point you told me about. Well, that's for sure. All right, then, I think we'd better get going. Can we get out of town without being seen? I don't want anybody to recognize your car, Sheriff. Well, uh, we can use the car that's being painted in Mac Green's garage Belongs to cousin of mine. Good, great. Uh, get out through the side door. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Don't make me feel like one of them big city police lieutenants. Well, <laughs> in this particular situation, Sheriff, uh, I wouldn't trade a slew of them for one of you. Dark and quiet. That's all. Hardly a soul ever passes on this road, Valentine. <sighs> well, we're lucky to have a full moon. Lucky to have a spot where we can hide and not be seen, see? <sighs> How long are we going to sit here, Valentine? Sheriff, your guess is as good as mine. Oh, sure getting cold. Yeah, it is that. Listen. I hear it. Going into second. Has to slow down. Yeah. Recognize it? Recognize the car? Oh, not yet. Hey, wait. Oh. What? Oh, that's Billy. Billy Johnson's jalopy. You sure? Yeah. The girl with it. Oh, just out joyriding, that's all. Oh, great. You know, I I think you're off on a goose chase, Valentine. Oh, but, Sheriff, they wouldn't take a chance on the highway. They must take this road. Now, please, please, Sheriff, wait a little longer, will you? Nope, I guess I... uh... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, listen. This could be it. Ready. Getting closer. That's a strange one. That's it. That's it. Now, wait. Okay. Okay, let's go. Hey, hold on. Stop that car. This is the sheriff. Stop. Get out, Sheriff. I think the light you aimed for the tire. Right. Hello. Sheriff, you all right? Oh, I got me in the shoulder. We got him, Sheriff. We got him. Come on out of that car and keep them high. Come out. We start shooting. You got me. I give up. Stand there. Well, 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 company. Marco and Ridley. Going joyriding? I, I, I... And surprise. Ralph Croner, I guess. Sure as Ralph. All trussed up and gay. Well, now, Sheriff, we'll get the whole story straight. (laughs) 
I know it might have been foolish, but I wanted to be the one to return the money that I stole. Well, why? I never suspected that you still had it. Uh, at first, I thought it would buy me anything that I want. But then, well, somehow, I, I knew I couldn't do that. And you knew that, didn't you, Bowen? Well, I suspected it. I didn't think Ralph had a chance to spend it. Then I paid him a visit in jail. He told me he was going to do something that would make Mr. Croner believe in him again. So you hired Ridley to help you find the money. And that's why Marco came here. Yes. Yes, but Ridley double-crossed me. I thought Ralph had really run away. Now, those two men were going to make me tell them where the money was. The safe was broken into to confuse the issue. Oh, I, I guess so. I was waiting for everyone to go to sleep so I could get the money. It was hidden outside the house. I heard the noise of the library. Must have been Ridley who knocked me out. Yeah, right? sure. Now, Ridley and Marco came out to the shack tonight. They said the place was going to be searched tomorrow morning, and they had to get me out of there tonight. Why, that's, that's what you had in mind all along, Mr. Valentine. Well, Mr. Croner, I was hoping a little trick might flush out the birds. It'd be a pretty hopeless job searching those hills. No, I... I want to make it absolutely clear I got clear news that... for you, Bowen. Just explain it to the sheriff. I got my work cut out for me. Explaining all this to a couple of curious ladies who missed all the excitement. <laughs> If engine wear is important to you, then this performance report should be, too. Here's more proof that heavy-duty RPM motor oil cuts wear in automobile engines. Using heavy-duty RPM, an engine in the Northwest ran over 130,000 miles, yet showed less than half as much wear in that time as other engines did after only 75,000 miles when lubricated with another oil. Heavy-duty RPM kept oil consumption way down and greatly increased the time between overhauls. It cut wear rate to a minimum and gave top protection against acid, gum, and corrosion. So get what's best for your car. Get heavy-duty RPM motor oil at any independent Chevron gas station or standard station, where they say and mean we take better care of your car. The way Ralph looked at you before must have told you... Well, how we both feel, Mr. Valentine. Sure, Betty, sure. Marco and Ridley are so mad at each other, they haven't stopped spilling the beans yet. Yeah, and Bowen will need all his lawyer's eloquence to get off with a short prison term. Oh, I think the sorriest man in all this is Uncle John. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I think he'll be a lot less positive about things in the future. Such things as honor, for instance. <laughs> his code of honor. But he said even cactus isn't all severe and unbending. It has beautiful flowers to soften it. Miracles of nature all around us. Even bachelor's buttons can suddenly change into orange blossoms. Just like that. Uh, I beg your pardon? No. It's a private joke of long standing. I'm sure Mr. Valentine can explain. Uh, the only thing Mr. Valentine will say at this moment is, uh, good night. Tonight's transcribed adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and directed by Kenneth Webb. Gigi Pearson was heard as Betty, Lester J. as Marco, Frank Gerstle as Ridley, Victor Rodman as Croner, and Bill Boucher as Bowen. Music by Gaylord Carter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Let George Do It is heard overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Give to the United Crusades seven great services in one. You give but once. Give enough for all. Listen to Let George Do It Again next Monday night at 8 p.m. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. KFRC, the Don Lee Station, San Francisco.